Listen, we are so excited about the conversation that we're going to get in today. It's going to be really, really good. We're going to have a COVID-19 discussion as it pertains to emotional wellness. There's been so much um, effort and information that's been thrown at us as it pertains to how COVID-19 affects us physically. But I think it's important that we think and really give attention to how this thing affects people emotionally and mentally. And so, Pastor, you thought it would be a great idea for us as a team to get together to have a discussion about how this illness, how this, this, this pandemic is affecting us, not just physically, but emotionally. So, Pastor, why did you think it was important for us to kind of come together and have this discussion? Well, there's this thing that's called COVID-19 that has mm -hmm. totally turned our world upside down. Uh -huh. um, I remember last year, I think it was toward the beginning of last year, in one of our staff meetings, I looked at all of you who are at the table and I said, um, by it, it is imperative that we really start addressing emotional health and the needs of people emotionally. We were great at addressing those things spiritually, uh, the, the, the issues that people deal with spiritually, but it's that whole emotional piece that I feel like um, we really got to get a grip on. Well, I, I, what I didn't know is that we'd be here where we are today. Yeah. And um, it's a very, it's very, uh, a very real issue. People are actually, people were dealing with trauma before COVID-19 ever hit. And so now we've got trauma on top of trauma yes. on top of trauma. Yes. And uh, I just really wanted to have this conversation so that um, we could possibly be a help to somebody. I heard um, the other day that any change in normal behavior um, causes grief. And any change in normal behavior causes grief. Well, our, all of us have had a change in our normal behavior. I really think it just hit me the other day. I think I'm grieving, um, not being able to have church because that, that is, that that's my life. That's what we do, you know? And so we've kind of pulled this panel of people together, um, just to see if we might could all add a little bit to the conversation that we might be able to answer some questions that you are asking, maybe some questions that you don't even know how to articulate, um, but they're still in your heart. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're here today. And so I'm gonna toss it back to you, Chris, mm -hmm. and you take it away. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, I read in a recent poll, it says nearly 45% of adults in the United States reported that their mental health has been negative, negatively impacted due to worry or stress over this virus. That's over half the pop, almost over half the population has been negatively affected by this virus. So we're going to kind of get into some, some, uh, this, this discussion and, uh, we've invited our pastors and, and, uh, so we have Pastor Joe, Pastor Jeremy, we have Pastor Travis, Pastor Lana, and then we also have our family ministries team. That is Phil, and that is Keturah Boston. And uh, we're excited to have Dr. Hope Russell with us today. Everybody just clap for Dr. Hope. She is the CEO and founder of Wellsprings um, Counseling uh, Center for Counseling Services. And so Dr. Hope, she's, a, she's an amazing person. And uh, I'm sure she's going to be able to offer a lot of insight. So we've kind of had some questions that were sent in. Uh, we Pastor always said this. I want to make sure that we're answering questions that you're asking. And so we kind of sent a poll out and people sent some questions in. And so we're going to kind of dive into some questions to kind of help us frame this conversation. So y'all ready? Can we, can we jump into this? All right, cool. Uh, the first question is, how do I identify and cope with loneliness? How do I identify and cope with loneliness? Pastor Travis, what are your, what are your thoughts about that? I think, um, you know, um, this COVID-19 has really brought about a complexity uh, because I believe that there, uh, there's a difference between loneliness and solitude. Yeah. I think solitude is a place that we retreat to recover, um, to make sense of ourselves, uh, to come to an awareness about who we are. Mm -hmm. And loneliness is like this negative uh, imagery that says, I'm alone, I have no friends, uh, and in some ways I don't have a future. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I don't have a hope. And what happens many times is right now, COVID-19, we're seeing both of them hand in hand. Yeah. We're seeing where we're forced into solitude. We're forced to retreat because of this virus. But at the same time, there's people that, are, that, that feel isolated. They feel alone. They feel like they're helpless. They're away from their family members. They're away from their routine. And one of the things that we have to do to overcome or even cope with loneliness is, is redefine what our normal is. Mm-hmm. We have to redefine those relationships. And so, for instance, um, uh, I would call my brother or my brother would call me uh, or he's wanting to, you know, come visit. Yeah. He can't. So I FaceTime him. And I think that that's a good way that we can use. I mean, people are using Zoom, people are using all different types of uh, media um, but I think those, that's one way. I mean, that's not the only way to deal with loneliness, but those loneliness makes you feel as though you have no connection to the outside world. You have no connection to those relationships. And you have to literally say to yourself, I do have a connection with yeah, those that's good, man. I do have friendships. I do have people that are in my corner. And how do I put that in action? It's by not just calling them, but right now we need to see your face. Yeah, I love that. I think this virus, it lends itself to um, isolation. I mean, like you're, you're already separate, you're stuck in your home. But I think, you know, finding creative means, whether it be through Zoom, whether it be through FaceTime, you know, my father, he celebrated his 67th birthday and we were able to get on a Zoom call with all of my brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews. That hadn't been done in a long time because we're all spread out. But it was a way for us to connect. And I think staying connected, being intentional about staying connected is, uh, is extremely important. Dr. Hope, what would you say about uh, loneliness and, and this virus and, and, and that? Well, I think one of the things that's most important is that we understand voluntary versus involuntary. Mm-hmm. Loneliness is typically involuntary. It's not something that we want. It's not something that we choose. And a lot of people are struggling with loneliness because this is not something of their choosing. Solitude, on the other hand, is voluntary. We are voluntarily choosing solitude. And it actually means that we're getting away from society or from social situations. And that, again, is typically a a choice. It can either be a positive choice where we want to kind of... um, do some self-examination we want to do some self-healing and some reflecting and so we're stepping away from society and social situations to get some peace and clarity or it could be like in this present we're taking a choice to self-quarantine for two weeks to keep ourselves safe and to keep others away so i think the, the a huge difference between the both is one is a choice and one is not and anytime your choice is taken away from you that's when it becomes a huge problem. And people are struggling because their choice is taken away. It's not so much, um, I'm lonely. The reality is the same opportunities that most of us have to connect with our family and friends now is the same opportunity that we've always had. We just had the choice whether or not to do it. Now that choice is being taken away from us, we are really struggling with the fact that we we're we don't have a choice now i don't have a choice whether i can get in my car and drive over to my mom's house or see her on sunday afternoon the choice that i have now is just to call her before i could either call her i could drive over there i could either meet her for lunch but now my choices are taken away i can only call or facetime so people are struggling with that the 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 fact that their choice has been taken away yeah. What are some ways you think, would you say that we can better cope with, with what you just discussed? Well, I think it's how you think about things. Um, that's one of the big premises that I follow is our mindset and how we think about these things. We're looking at loneliness right now as a long term situation. And it's just a small caveat in our lives. I mean, yeah. when you look at your life in a lifespan. I always tell people, hold your hand straight out. That's your lifespan. And then imagine on your lifespan, 
this much time. It's just temporary. So if you can start thinking about this is just a temporary situation. This is not a permanent lifelong situation. I'm lonely now. Why am I lonely? And when I get out of this, what do I need to do? Or what can I look forward to? What can changes can I make so that I don't have to be in this position again? So really it's changing the situation from a long-term situation to a temporary situation. And then back to what Pastor Travis said, get on the phone, text people, call people. FaceTime people, write letters. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> I love that though. Write letters. What does that mean write letters? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's great. The other day, uh, Keisha, she's she helps, she's over like our servant leaders. And uh, I went to the mailbox and I, I got a, you know, I went to the mailbox and I got some mail and opened it up. And it was a handwritten note from Keisha. Um, just telling, you know, myself and Tina, listen, I miss you guys, you know, the impact that you guys have had on my life. And she just kind of put that. And it's been so long since I have seen somebody write something <laughs> on a piece of paper to me and me get it out of mailbox. It really just it touched me. It was, it was just beautiful. It was special. So I absolutely loved it. I think that's one thing that we can do. Pastor Joe, you were you were you have something to say here? Yeah, I think uh, to Hope's point. I don't deal with anxiety on a regular basis, but if I did face any anxiety around this time, it was when they started talking about a mandatory shutdown. To her point that when I felt like my power was taken from me and I no longer had a choice whether or not I could leave the house, it raised, I, like I said, I don't feel like a person that's normally anxious. I normally have a regular sleep pattern. I normally have a regular routine. But there was something about being told I could literally not leave my house. And then we started all these conspiracy theories. Yeah. So people were calling. Everybody had a cousin that worked for the CIA or yeah. the <laughs> or the, uh, the 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 National Guard, and they're going to activate the National Guard. You're going to have to show papers to leave your house. And the uncertainty of that put me in a very uncomfortable position because I don't mind being at home. Um, and I think a lot of people are having to confront the statement where they say, well, I'm an introvert. I don't like to be around people. Well, now you can't be around people. And so it's made people that are normally self-isolated have to confront the fact that I'm not as much of an introvert as I just like to have my way all the time, where I like to run the conversation. I like to run the room. And so this has shown us that there is power greater than ours. And I think it's made us crave connection in an, an unprecedented way and also seek out ways to maintain that connection. So for us, my mom, uh, who I would talk to maybe once a week or you know, sporadically, now she reads stories to my son and my nephew every night through wow. face, Facebook Messenger. They have this interactive story reading thing and it's become a routine where normally we would all be saying, my sister's an attorney, her husband uh, is a teacher, my wife is a teacher and I work full time. And so we'd all, we're all, we're so busy, mm -hmm. but this lack of uh, the ability to connect has made us seek it out. It's like we're thirsty for it. Yeah. I feel more connected to the pastors on this panel today than I did before COVID-19 because <laughs> we're texting each other 50 times. If I wake up too late, yeah. I wake up to 55 text messages. 55 and text <laughs> It's made us seek it. Like, how can we connect? How can we stay? How can we stay in each other's lives? Because there's something about scarcity that makes you value things that you normally devalue. Yeah. Can I just, I, 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 want, I want to say something too. I think what uh, the, back to what uh, Dr. Hope was talking about in terms of um, choice in the matter. One is not voluntary one is involuntary i think this idea of we're forced to make time for things that we've been busy avoiding and i think that that's one of the things that people are confronted with right now like you're co confronted with the idea that everything you have swept under the rug mm -hmm. things that you have tried to bypass things that you have know that you have to do but you've put it off you're now confronted with the reality is that all you have is time now. 
get her done. Yeah. Whether it be externally, whether it be home improvements, yeah. or whether it may be something internally or relationally. And that can cause a sense of, you know it's time to do the work in terms of solitude. But now you're, you're not willing it or it creates a type of you know, anxiety or depression because now you're confronted with it and you can't escape it. You either have to deal, you, you really are confronted with your own reality. And sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult, which, call, which causes all these types of emotions in people because now I actually have to be still. And I think for us as Americans, I think for us as Christians, so I think some of the hardest things that we can ever do is simply be still. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that is so, so good. Pastor Jeremy, you was wanting to jump in? Yeah, uh, just, just something that Dr. Hope said triggered uh, something. What I'm, what I'm doing is just reframing my mindset. Um, and I think they, you know, I've heard people call it cognitive reframing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being safe at home means that I'm protecting my friends mm -hmm. or, or wanting to get out is being safe at home. Uh, you know, I, I, I've tried to just, you know, reframe my mind, reframe my focus. I know uh, in the Bible it talks about in Romans 12 and 2, uh, transforming your mind, changing the way you think. Yeah. Uh, and I think the choices that we make in terms of how we think will also help us uh, during this pandemic season where we're facing isolation um, and where we're insulating. We're actually insulating and protecting ourselves when we change the way we think. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's so important that we reframe okay. our mindset. Uh, uh, I, can, I can do more. And, and in terms of control, uh, I think the more productive we are gives us a sense of control uh, in terms of not being able to get out, in terms of not being able to do the things that we used to do. Uh, but I'm finding that my productivity, whether I'm uh, from an exercise standpoint, if I go do a walk run, uh, it, it, it just reframes my mind in terms of, okay, in my physical body, I'm, I'm being productive even by walking. Or if I can't go to the gym, uh, I still have my mat out and I'm in my garage doing push-ups and sit-ups. Um, if there's something uh, to what Pastor Travis uh, had shared that I have swept under the rug that I haven't done and I'm able to finish a project, uh, it, productivity allows me to have a little bit more control. Uh, and I'm just grateful uh, for the ability and learning how to reframe. Uh, how to reset my mind uh, during this season. So uh, I think cognitive reframing, uh, reframing our mindset. Uh, I knew God was the initial <laughs> uh, presenter of reframing, cognitive reframing, uh, but I'm thankful for the practical level that we can do it on, in, especially during this pandemic. Oh, that's, that's great, man. Love that. Perspective is always paramount. It is it's definitely a game changer. Uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Phil, you was wanting to say something, then we're going to go to the next question. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that um, I, I read somewhere that every student needs at least five positive role models in their lives mm -hmm. to help ensure their success in life. And one of the things that I love that, um, that we have implemented long ago and it's just really shining right now is our small group leaders. Um, they have played a paramount role role um, especially during this time of reaching out you know there are, we have several students that um, that are uh, like Pastor Joe said they're uh, introverts and so they kind of stand off and and you know kind of get back in the cut and you know really not being involved as, as you know when we were physically here but it's um, you know it's giving them a, a space where they can um, talk uh, giving them a, a some leaders to look up to, some examples of, you know, we can't assume that they have the, the, the greatest examples at home all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's being intentional about, put the, the Bible says that uh, in the multitude of counsel, there's mm -hmm. safety. And, and we've been intentional about uh, putting the right people around them to, to have conversation. When, when I'm not feeling good, what we like to do is we like to, again, hide it under the rug. Uh, until 
one day it's kind of like, look, here's everything, yeah. right? Here's all that I've been experiencing. <laughs> and, and I've had personal, day. yeah, I've had personal uh, experiences in that. And um, it's, it's kind of helping us, um, let's, let's talk about what's really happening in our lives so that we can really deal with, um, you know, those situations and not have these outbursts and have all these different things. So I think one of the greatest things that we've implemented in our ministry is, is small group leaders, uh, not having a single person that he's the only person or she's the only person that can speak in their life. Yeah. But we have been created uh, and empowered our servant leaders to be able to, to speak into their lives, to be there um, and partnering with parents because parents can't do it on their own. Yeah. Right. And we, we have to be intentional uh, to make sure they're either going to, squad build their own squad or we can be intentional as parents to help put the right people around them so that we can set them up to really win in life and especially during this time where they feel uh you know the most vulnerable or the uh, the you know i'm just the most lonely right mm -hmm. because it was it was a problem before we could be around a thousand people and yet still feel lonely oh, yeah. and so it, it's you know that's i mean so good. That's so good. So the, the level of intentionality behind making sure that not one student is left behind or left uncovered. Yeah. Um, you're ensuring that sense of connect, you know, being connected. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. And um, I'm sure it's effective. Uh, this is a great one. And, and Pastor Lanham, I want you to, if you can, just take the lead on this one. Um, how do I grieve the loss of loved ones, celebrations, jobs, opportunities? expectations how do i handle grief pastor made a statement at the beginning any change in a pattern of behavior can cause grief so it's not just in losing a loved one but in any of these particular um, areas how how can a person handle that grief um i think definitely um the fact that here's the thing is, is that we cannot eliminate grief but we can manage grief um, and we have to take ownership over that process and what does that journey look like? And we have to, um, when we begin to feel affected by grief and it can come in an onset of sadness that, um, that it is, can be triggered by memories or it can be triggered by actions. It can be triggered by just a multitude of things. But, um, we have to begin to uh, make some decisions to say, how am I going to manage this, first of all? Um, because if you don't manage it, it'll manage you. <laughs> it's like a wave. Sure. Um, you either gonna ride that wave and you're gonna do your best to, to attempt to ride that wave or you're gonna drown in the wave of grief, emotions, um, feelings, um, and we cannot be in denial of it, um, but we have to make a choice in the very beginning to say, I'm going to choose to manage this. Um, I think I wrote down like three things that I just, that have helped me. And I know um, I've seen it in the lives of others to, to help others, but is first of all, is to give ourselves permission to feel. Pastor Brady always says, and has taught, to, uh, taught us, um, if you don't feel, you can't heal. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we feel it. So we cannot be in denial of it. Um, number two, we can't stuff become a stuffer um, to Pastor Phil's point, uh, we have to be able to talk up and talk out. Um, we, that's like a huge key in it. Um, and number three is self-care. Uh, self-care is so vital, not only just during um, this season that we're in, but in grieving um, in general, and like Pastor Jeremy said, taking walks, doing different things. Um, it's important that we stay hydrated. It's important that we rest during this time. Um, uh, grief, uh, it, it is a club that nobody wants to be in. Um, but what I do know is that it can either unite us or divide us. And it goes back to initially making that choice in the beginning, how to choose to manage this. Um, and the Bible, want, the, the, the Lord wants us to be good stewards in every season of our life. And it, sound, it might sound weird to say it this way, but we have to also steward grief well. Mm -hmm. because we want to come out of it we want to grow through grief not just go through it and we and then at the end come out with the smell of smoke on us we, say that one line again grow through it instead of going through it. that is so powerful yeah. i didn't mean it that was just good to me sorry 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it's like what, what uh, I've heard, you know, pastors say so many times during this, this season of COVID-19 that we're in, we have, there has been so much lost and shame on us if we don't come out of this saying, Lord, what have you taught me? There has been, there has been, you know, so many, dev so much devastation. There's been so much grief. There's been loss with life. There's been loss, there's been loss with, with uh, relationships. And uh, we, you know, what we have to do is we have to be able to come out of this, especially as leaders and influencers, um, whether we're influencing thousands of people or were the influencer in our home. We have to come out of this with some spoils. We have to come out of this with lessons. We have to come out of this saying, God, I'm not coming out empty handed. Right. <laughs> um, and so I think it's important that we did make a decision. And if we, if you're already in that deep process of grief, it hasn't maybe just begun. You still can make that decision to say from this day forward, this is how I'm going to manage this process. I am going to steward this season of my life well and I'm going to gain something from it I'm going to learn something from it because the one of the biggest things that you can do during grieving and being um uh, during grieving instead of just um going through it selfishly um we can go through it and we can give to others and pour back into the others and that is a huge leap of faith but it's also a huge step in the healing process and while you're giving you don't have no idea the sovereignty of god and what he's doing in your life while you're pouring into someone else's life while you're giving someone else joy while you're writing someone a card in a handwritten card and putting it in the snail mail um, while your heart is broken. You could be sitting there crying, but you're, but you're pouring out love and, and, and joy into someone else. Um, I kind of smiled a minute ago because Pastor Jeremy was in Romans and one of the scriptures I wrote down too was Romans 12 and 12. And it says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction and faithful in prayer. Mm -hmm. Be patient in affliction that's going back to the stewardship aspect. Like when we're in afflicted or when we're being afflicted, when we're being somewhat um, uh, isolated because of social distancing, you know, we have to be patient in affliction. And he doesn't just say that in the word for no reason. Being patient in affliction is because there is something to learn from it. There's something to come out of it with and to be able to pour back into someone else. Um, if I can do this, you can do this. Those encouraging actions um, that we take to give to others, again, it's, it's a leap of faith because you sometimes are thinking, I'm empty. What do I have to give? You know, but you have no idea the small, like I got a card too from Lakeisha. I got a personal card for me and the, that lit my day up. I just smiled like, oh my gosh, you know? And so it's just, you just even, you don't realize like the simple things that you can um, that you can pour back into someone else that um, that they really need and sometimes we're just too into ourselves or into the moment that we don't think they need us but we need each other wow. yeah. is... and can I say this too grief grief is a couple things to me uh, it's a beast number one uh, but it's also a gift because it's grief is how we for me how I've been able to process pain and mm -hmm. I think God gives us the ability to grieve. And a lot of people, if we, if we don't allow ourselves to grieve, um, we, we, if you don't grieve right, you don't heal right. I'm going to say that again. If you don't grieve right, you don't heal right. And so in order for us to heal right, we have to grieve right. And, and the wrong way to grieve is to try to deny it or to try to stuff it. Mm -hmm. Back to your point, Phil, um, and, and Lana, all the incredible things you just told us was, was just awesome. But we have to allow ourselves the space to grieve. Now, I, for me, I have to stay in control of that. Mm -hmm. I have known God long enough, and I've known his faithfulness long enough, and I've known his word long enough not to allow grief to consume me. You have to be the watchman on the wall. Okay, let me let me just say that I think that's important. I when w losing like my sister, like my mother, and even in this point of not being able to go to church, I'm getting to the point where I recognize grief when it rolls in. 
And I also have to t remind myself, now you, you have control over this. You, it, it's like depression. If you, if you give it an inch, it will take a mile. Uh, it's very real. Grief is very real. But I, I choose to say at some point in the process, if I feel like crying, I'm going to cry. But I also choose to say, but you know what? This is, this is the good thing about that. This is the good thing about this. You have to come to a point where you stop and you remind yourself, yes, I'm isolated. I'm in a house. I, I can't necessarily get out. And even though they're lifting some of the restrictions, we still have these things in our mind that says, no, what if I go out and what if I cross paths with somebody? So to me, you can lift it all day long. I'm still under house arrest. Uh, but, right. but it's, it's, it's like you, you can, you can tell, you can tell yourself, yes, I'm isolated, but then you can say, but you know what? Look, I'm isolated at home. I got all the clothes I need. I got the books I need. I've got things I can do. I can, I can do get on my to-do list. I mean, it's not like we're in a prison cell somewhere. Okay. So you have to remind yourself, you know what? It's, it's not fun, but it could be so much worse. Mm -hmm. It could be so much worse. That's when I say you have to stay in control of that thing. You have to remind yourself of the goodness of God yeah. and you have to speak to yourself. So it's, it's not just about our perspective, but it's also about what we say to ourselves. So give yourself that time to grieve, but don't let it push you over the edge.